So 3D printing essentially involves just printing or developing a structure from the ground up, uh, taking one layer at a time, be it polymer or be it metal, for example, and putting down that layer of polymer or metal and then fusing it in some way into, into position and then creating the next layer on top of that. It's powerful technology. It's really turned manufacturing on its head. So instead of taking a block of something and, and chiseling out the final shape that you want, you build it up uh, from the ground. And that means you can make quite complex shapes, things that are not possible to manufacture uh, by other means. So what this has done, the impact that it's had on research laboratories, and for people like me as a research scientist, is it's had a dramatic impact on our ability to turn thoughts into things. So, you know, scientists and researchers dream up new ideas a dime, a dime a dozen, you know, we're generating new ideas every minute. But 3D printing empowers the scientists, empowers researchers to be able to turn those ideas into real tangible things. Now, they, they may not be the product that you're going to use, but they're the tools that we're going to use in the laboratory to generate those products that you're going to use. So it really has revolutionized the way we think about doing research. It's empowered researchers to be much more creative than the researchers that we were even five years ago. We can afford to be much more, much bolder, much more ambitious in the types of projects that we undertake because of the advent of 3D printing. So I see myself as belonging to a generation that can bridge old and new. And as a craftsperson who embraces um, new technology, I try to take the best from both worlds by respecting tradition, but always looking towards the future. My jewellery is made using a combination of processes, obviously. New technologies, traditional techniques, aid, it's aided by computerised machinery, but also finished with hand skills. It's informed by my craft training and philosophy, which places an emphasis on the understanding of both material and process. I try to come up with ideas that are a product of the process being used, that could not be produced using conventional means, and perhaps more importantly, would not have been conceived with conventional knowledge. So digital fabrication has ha obviously had a significant impact on my practice. It's changed not only the way that I make, but it's changed the way I think about making. Through my work, I try to seek out ways that technology can surprise, how it can aid in pushing the boundaries of possibility, and how it may challenge what we think we already know by exposing the potential of what's to come. We know that um, in, in our community, in Australia, arthritis accounts as the third commonest cause of disability. It affects about 15% of our population, around about 3 million people will require treatment for their arthritis. But what we and, and Gordon, my team in Melbourne and, and Gordon are trying to do is look at ways of combining a patient's own stem cell taken out of their body and grown, mixed with little scaffolds that Gordon makes, grow it up and put it back into the patient. What we hope to do, though, is capitalize on what we've spent this whole afternoon talking about, which is 3D printing. Why not use a special printer to print up that defect and fill it, for example? If you have a pen with two cartridges in it, let's say the pink cartridge is the material that we make our scaffold out of. And let's say the blue ink contains the special stem cells that we all have. And we use that in a very special way designed in Gordon's lab to print out a structure that is a combination of the scaffold with the cells in it itself. So imagine printing out the cells and the scaffold directly into that hole in someone's knee. The interesting thing is we can think back to all the science fiction movies we saw 10, 15, 20 years ago, and how many of those things are true today? Well, in fact, imagination is no longer the limitation. Almost anything you can imagine, people can do or will be able to do into the future. We've already heard a little bit about uh, 3D printing of live cells and the potential for um, using scaffolds from the 3D uh, structures together with uh, live printed cells um, to be able to perhaps develop human body parts.
we're a fair way off from, from being able to see that. We might very well want to know about, well, what's the biocompatibility? Are the structures safe? Is it the case that we know that uh, what's going to happen over time when the degradation of this occurs? Do we want to use biodegradable materials so that eventually the cells are, are growing in the ordinary way? Or do we want to be able to control that? And how do we um, address concerns about product liability and responsibility in those cases? The technology may be speeding up the rate with which we have to ask questions that were already coming towards us, and they may make us stop and think for a moment. And so we may ask ourselves whether or not we're ready for addressing them. And then we as a community need to engage in discussion about what it is we want, what we fear, what we hope for. For every bit that there is a good reason to be concerned about, there's also reason to be thinking about how can we achieve the positive aspects, the opportunities, without hitting the negative bits, without running into risks or harms.